Well, a very good morning to you on this second Sunday in July. We begin with words from the prophet Nahum, who declared, Look there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, O Judah, and fulfill your vows. Today is a good news day, a day of celebration. Uh, this morning I am uh, taking uh, Peter Groom's sermon and I will attempt to uh, to preach it. I won't preach it quite like Peter, but I, I will bring his message for this week. And um, we'll be thinking on the jailer and his family in Acts chapter 16. And uh, also, for those of you, you know, who are not going to be there on Sunday, just to say we will be celebrating uh, the good news that six people will be being baptised and two people will renew their baptism vows. So a lovely, wonderful day. And we look, look you know, forward to that, to being in the water with them. Well, it is a good news day because uh, we know that Christ has died for us and rose again for us. Every day is Easter day. So we come to the God who loves us, who knows us and who saves us. We come to him now in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we welcome you here today. Come by your Holy Spirit and fill this place with your presence. We lift up our hearts to you and offer the praise that's due your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And a prayer of confession. Lord God, we confess that we have sinned through our own fault and in common with others in our thinking and in our speaking, in our actions. We ask to be forgiven and by the power of your spirit, turn us from evil to good. Help us to forgive others and keep us in your ways of righteousness and love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. For well, we know that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Therefore, let us hear his word to us today. He says, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Thanks be to God. Well, before we come to our reading, just a couple of notices. And firstly, that next Saturday, the 20th of July is a youth evening at seven o'clock. And then on Sunday, after the morning service, we will be having a church meeting. And then after the church meeting, uh, we will be going up to Eaton Park to join with Holy Trinity Church um, for a, an asylum seeker get together. So both ourselves and a Holy Trinity uh, the sort of two main churches that deal with asylum seekers here in Norwich. And we're having a time when we get together and we just can have some fun, probably play football, um, listen to some music, eat some food, that kind of thing. So um, please do come along if you'd like to. Uh, that will be immediately after the church meeting. Um, but if you're not coming, then do please pray for our asylum seekers. as they either await to hear whether they're able to stay in this country or for those who have been given leave to remain, that they can be reunited with family, that they can actually start to work and contribute to society. So do you please continue praying for our asylum seekers. Well, we come now to our reading from scripture. And before I read, let's pray. Gracious God, by your Holy Spirit, 
open our hearts to your word. We thank you that you have spoken to us in many ways and at different times through your word. Now, Lord, as we hear your word read, so may now we hear your voice through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So our reading, <coughs> excuse me, our reading is Acts chapter 16, and we're beginning at uh, verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptised. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he'd come to believe in God, he and his whole household. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I shall just get the uh, Peter's words up here, just a moment. So, this story of the jailer. We have been continuing our series, uh, Good News for dot dot dot, and each week we are looking at good news for different people, different types of people that we read about in uh, the book of Acts. And this week, it's good news for the jailer. And of course, first of all, it's good news at Philippi, because that's where the jail was. And Paul and Silas were there in a Philippian jail. Now, this book of Acts shows authentic Christianity at work. Um, and this is the record of the, that first generation of Christians led by men appointed by our Lord with special powers to back up their authority in establishing the church. It's through these apostles and prophets that their teaching concerning our Lord Jesus Christ became the foundation on which our lives and the church are built. In our reading, arriving at Philippi, we have three incidents expressing the power of the good news that is the gospel. Three supernatural signs. And of course, when I say supernatural, I don't mean those kind of fantasies seen on TV or in movies or in novels. We're here watching the supernatural power and grace of God through the Holy Spirit. And these three instances of supernatural actions are firstly the expulsion of an evil spirit, um, uh, an explosion of an earthquake and the experience of the eternal. We begin with the expulsion of the evil spirit. Now, if you want to pause the recording and go further back in Acts chapter 16 to read the whole part about um, Paul and Silas uh, in uh, Philippi, you'll read, you know, about um, the um the slave girl 
who um, was basically possessed by an evil spirit, gifted with the ability to fortune tell, a gift welcomed by evil men who profited from her gift because they owned her. She was gifted with insight that she knew who Paul and Silas were. Now, these men are servants of the living God. Day by day, she kept following them and declaring these two men, servants of the Most High God, who proclaimed to us the way of salvation. Well, as James writes, do you believe God is one? Well, so do the devils, and they tremble. What's wrong with this girl endorsing the message of Paul? Have you ever wondered that? Well, can Satan's kingdom divide itself? Was it having a detrimental effect on the kingdom of darkness? Well, what we do know is it annoyed and distressed Paul. He put a stop to it by invoking the name of Jesus Christ. The power of Jesus' name, the nature of Christ, is behind the authority of Paul. The evil spirit then had to depart. And so this slave girl is no longer a slave of Satan. And what became of her, we don't know. But what we do know is that no longer could she, um, was she able to tell fortunes. And of course, that annoyed her slave owners, who they profited from her. Now, just to say one thing. Many men profit from uh, from holding women in slavery, whether it's you know in t in t today's modern world, you know the sex you know, slaves, you know the you know those people who are held where their um, their passport or the documentation is taken from them, you know, and it, and it happens still today, where. People are held in modern day slavery. Well, we've got that here with this slave girl who is freed from her slavery by Paul. Slavery to Satan. And we do know that um, Paul and Silas were, as a result of this, they were arrested, they were beaten, and they were imprisoned, all because they had arrest, they had um, delivered this girl from the dominion of darkness. You know, still happens today. People don't like it when you talk about the kingdom of darkness, mm. when you talk about the need for deliverance. But it's still today as much a reality as it was back in the time of Paul and Silas. So, our first, uh, first action here is the expulsion of the evil spirit. Secondly, the explosion of the earthquake, this supernatural sign where, in the sense, the building was shattered, it was rocked to its core, to its foundations, and yet the prison doors opened, the chains fell off, but no lives were lost. In the depths of the prison, at around midnight, before this earthquake, what do we have? Paul and Silas keeping everyone up by singing hymns and praying. Well, I wonder, with all those people in the jail listening, at the, you know, at the stroke of midnight, listening to Paul and Silas, I reckon they must have heard the gospel through them, through their prayers, through their singing. And not only the other prisoners, but also the jailer. You know, this earthquake that shook the building, destroyed nothing except the doors were opened, the locks were undone, the chains fell off, the prisoners 
were free to go. Now the jailer, being confident that the prisoners were safe and secure, you know, he probably fell asleep. You know, normally people can't get out of chains in a prison. But what a shock when the tremors came of that earthquake. And not only did the building shake, but the jailer shook, trembled, when he found that the prison doors were open. And that would have meant the prisoners had gone and he was about to fall on his sword. That would have been the punishment for letting a prisoner escape. But what they find, or what he found, was no one had escaped. Not one. And Paul tells him, you know, we're all here, don't harm yourself. Now, every true conversion produces this shock, this internal earthquake, if you like, to some degree. We've had that with Lydia, whose life had been changed. You know, now uh, we've got every, in one sense, conversion is accompanied by a spiritual sharing of the Holy Spirit. And here the jailer received not only the physical shock, but also the emotional and spiritual shock, which shook his conscience, which led him to the most important question of all. So the second supernatural sign is the, the earthquake, that earthquake which shook the place the explosion, if you like, of the earthquake. Which brings us to the third supernatural sign, and that's the experience of the eternal. Every Christian, every follower of Christ, is a result of the supernatural operation of God through the work of his Holy Spirit, who awakens in us our deep need for God. It's like Caesar Milan said, God awoke me as like a mother with a kiss. But he still had to be awoken. And when he comes again, Jesus said, he shall convince the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. Now I wonder whether our jailer, when he went to sleep, whether he had any concern for his soul. Well, he certainly felt it now. He felt the full weight of God, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. A lost man, in one sense he was free, and yet he wasn't. He was under the sentence of death, needing salvation. The prisoners, in one sense, now were free men. And here we have the jailer under the sentence of death awaiting the judgment and wrath of God because of sin. Someone once said in the house group, I don't like that preacher, he's always on about sin. Well, I wonder what they would have said about Paul and Jesus. The preacher like those others with a bad press, the Puritans, whose watchword was in fact joy. They also had a sin consciousness, but the Puritans had a Christ centrality. As Thomas Watson put it, two things I find difficult. The first is to make the wicked sad. The second is to make the godly joyful. Like Paul here, it always leads to Christ as in our reading. Now brought to a consciousness of sin, he asked the question that no one asks unless they realise their danger and their dilemma. The question is, what must I do to be saved? There is an urgency about this question, an imperative about this question. And of course, the answer comes in verse 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Of course, we then read how Paul then spoke the word of God to them. Maybe he was giving a fuller explanation of the gospel. Well, what we do know 
is that I'm I'm sure he said something like, you know, talked about the simple justification by faith. Faith alone is what we need, nothing else added to it. It's not believe in the Lord Jesus and do X, Y, and Z. It's believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. It's as simple as that. And that's the nature of faith. It means to believe in him, not just believe about him, but to put your trust in him, to know him through his abiding in us by his Holy Spirit. And the truth that we are to trust is that Jesus is the only saviour. There is no other name given under heaven by which people can be saved. There's no other saviour. There's no other co-redemptrix or helper. It's Jesus who is our saviour. And that's his full title, if you like. He is the Lord Jesus Christ, indicating his full deity, his full humanity, and his messiahship. He is the Lord. He is Jesus, the man, Lord God, and Christ, Messiah, God's anointed one. And so we are to trust in him. And when we trust in him, we receive full assurance of salvation. And like the jailer, we can be sure that we are saved. One of the sadnesses is when I meet people who aren't sure that they're saved. But you can be sure, 100%. And it's not being sure because of what you have done. It's being sure because of what he has done for you. And this faith, this belief, and this assurance is for now and for the future. The moment we believe and receive Jesus as Lord of our lives, we are saved. As Fanny Crosby puts it in the hymn, To God Be the Glory, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. And that's offered to all. It was offered to the jailer and his household. So faith is exercised through action. And notice what happened once the uh, jailer put his faith in Christ. He washed them. He bound up their wounds. He was then baptised, like our baptisms this morning. And then he took them into his home and he fed them. He cared for them. This all shows a change of heart, a change of attitude, a changed life. Making a confession through the action of baptism declared that he and his household now belong to Christ. And the only thing stopping us and preventing us is that of unbelief. So I say to you today, believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that through your death and resurrection, and by our putting our faith in you and what you have already done for us, we can know that we are saved. And so for any who are watching this and do not yet know that they are saved, Lord, would you come by your Holy Spirit and give them that assurance of salvation. Assure them in their heart of hearts that they are saved. And Lord, we pray for those who are being baptised today. Lord, as they go down into the water, wash them clean. As they come up, 
may your Holy Spirit so fill them with new life that they are changed people and that they live for you every day of their lives. So Lord, we pray for them and for those who will renew their vows of baptism. May all of us this day remember our baptism and remember that you have saved us in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and with everyone you love, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve and share the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining me today. Do pray for those who've been baptised and those who've renewed their baptism vows. Pray for them that they may walk with Christ and know his protection. Please pray for them, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now.